I made some changes to the presentation and I decided to call it this. Uh, um, and uh, I'm working on a paper at the moment uh, and trying to rearrange some of the ideas that I uh, came up with during the PhD, but I'm trying to rearrange things. So um, it's going to be, uh, we'll see as we go. Uh, so we are all historians, we are all storytellers, and let me begin with a story. Um, okay. Yes, uh, in, Jackie has alluded to the Mother's Darlings project that I was uh, involved in as a, a researcher, and it was here that I found when I asked the question, what did Samoan women do during the times of war, during World War uh, II, that is? And I found something that was quite unsettling because they seemed to have given me a history that was quite uh, uh, whispered. It's something that was whispered. It's not, and it's whispered in quiet conversations. And that got me thinking because it seemed to have carried a host of interpretations and attitudes towards women and war. So that performance, that whispering, um, was uh, led me to think perhaps there is something else. Because when I asked, what did our women do during that time? This was the direct answer they went to, to the women and their babies. And I thought to myself, if after several generations, uh, this is the only history we have, there is definitely something wrong with us. So, Okenya Samoa Malako Kamai Malingi was the history of Samoan women and war that I inherited. And I did not like it very much. And it was something that I refused to accept. This, I refused to accept it. Um, such legacy, it's got a lot of gaps already just by listening to it. And I began to question why only one specific aspect of Samoan women's lives is emphasized in Samoan wartime memories. Because I believe there is a range of women's uh, experiences during the war that are of equal uh, importance and our, it's our job to explore it. And so I therefore, uh, at that time, called for a reconsideration of the history that I received. And that began the PhD, the, that was the genesis of the uh, PhD research. I looked at the historiography and I found there were issues there. Most of these experiences were basically during the post-war period and some were far back as well. But there, in uh, uh, 2000, towards the end of the first decade of uh, uh, this century, you find people like Judy Bennett coming through with natives and exotics and their commitment to um, record the war and uh, the environment as an actor of war. And I thought that, yeah, women, of course, were actors in whether the, the society in Pacific, the theater of war, was a combatant one or not. In 2007, I completed uh, uh, an MA where I looked at odd men from the Pacific, looking at um, Pacific men who went with the 28 uh, Maori Battalion. But I seem to have uh, found myself um, in a group of, uh, uh, of historians who were uh, working on uh, war projects then. And I became one of those uh, authors in uh, the Mother's Darlings uh, project, writing that uh, there are no commoners in Samoa. And it talks about the acceptance of the Samoan society and how the Samoan uh, society and that generation after the war owes uh, those women, all those women, an apology for all the, the treatment they received. Previous assessors on Samoan women's lives, uh, they had different questions, they had different focuses, 
and different motivations. I too had different uh, uh, questions. And so I decided during my PhD that these were the aspects I was going to look at uh, to present some form of window that we can look into the lives of these women and see how they engage with the war through the church uh, in their villages and their roles uh, in their families and to experience also those hard uh, areas to talk about that's always going to be in euphemism, uh, sexual encounters. But it was during the time when they had the Andy Warhol uh, exhibition come to Te Papa that uh, all this, I went to see it and, uh, and I thought, yeah, well, popular culture. And then I began to think, well, I would like also to uh, explore uh, popular culture. And I had brilliant supervisors who said, yeah, why not? And so I added that lot in. Uh, uh, the project was an oral history project, so because there was a lack of uh, sources already in the secondary uh, sources, I had to go and dig up the archives and consult the women who were historians themselves. Popular culture, of course, in terms of the definition, it is a way of life and uh, the things that appeal to ordinary people in the their everyday life rather than that of the educated uh, ones. Um, it includes our media object, entertainment and leisure. It's, it's everywhere now, ah. but uh, in thinking about it here, uh, wartime popular culture at that time includes the cultural material ah, or objects specifically designed by various army departments to regulate the morale and to drive the patriotic will to defend one's country. And this view is in line with a Gramscian approach to popular culture that um, John's story describes as the compromised equilibrium. And so I, I took this uh, basic definition and observed how they, it can be character, how you would see it in uh, um, an indigenous uh, society before the uh, arrival of the war. And as soon as you use this frame, a lot of other things come up. Using popular culture, you're dealing with material. Things like how did chow time gets into the Samoan language. The idea is that later on, uh, Patty O'Brien, uh, uh, looked at when, when she did the, the Muses of the Pacific, the idea of Holonesians mixed together with Mills and Boons and village anthems, things like shampoo, baby roof and chocolate, the Pearl of the Pacific, which was a nightclub, and engagement with stockings. These were all the things that once you use this, uh, when I use this uh, frame, these things came up. Uh, so these are the experiences that have escaped the notice of those scholars who shared the view that wartime economics, mostly some on men's economic activities, stimulated a series of social transformation, which led to economic benefit and outward migration. By contrast, the focus on popular culture provides a new way to explore how women affected on the ground changes during the war. Of course, social change is a very messy, internalized, personal process that does not always have a neat, top-down trajectory with clearly defined boundaries. The women's narratives reveal that social change is the sum of agency. And so women's engagement with wartime popular culture is a significant example of how new experiences uh, create new knowledge that can be adapted and integrated to local situations informing cultural practices that are relevant and useful to the family during World War times.
when I had looked at popular culture uh, before the war, it was predominantly indigenous in origin. So it was very much influenced by the church and colon uh, colonial culture then. Uh, of course, if you're looking at cinemas, you'll be looking at 1914 and uh, uh, how people brought their uh, cultural material from uh, Prussia, from the old motherland to Samoa and to try and to entertain themselves. And it's something that was familiar to them as they are at the edge of the empire. Families and villages provided the main avenues for popular culture. Ah, and of course you have chanting, singing, dancing, and art were forms of record keeping, songs and dances, anthems as well, proverbial expressions derived from the environment and daily uh, routines. The Samoan games, some of our participants, uh, um, when I talked to them before about what they did before the war and some of the things they enjoyed, um, they were playing games like this Talanga uh, Taui or Tolinga Nun. And of course, these are games played. There's always a, 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 an objective to it. And of course, it's followed by the feasting. And there's always that etiquette of uh, feasting for the younger people at the end. Engagement with uh, indigenous war, uh, it's our indigenous um, uh, pop culture at the time. You have people who engaged, uh, uh, their engagement was part of an etiquette. Uh, Samoan women engaged uh, uh, with indigenous uh, popular culture in gender groups such as the Awaluma, the women, the unmarried women's uh, uh, a group. And as a young, uh, sis, younger sister of a chosen Taupo, Fasalafa, you have here, um, remembered her pre-war experience with Samoan popular culture as part of the Waluma. Um, singing, of course, is always there. But th these are part of the courtship uh, ritual that ancient, uh, Samoa used to, uh, to do. Uh, The church, of course, here in this case, uh, the nuns were very much influential in how Samoan women engage uh, with pop culture in the 1920s. Uh, if you look at this uh, picture here from the uh, Catholic archives, of course, it's a pastime to do crocheting. That is something that was very foreign to a Samoan young woman. But because these ladies, um, the nuns, were also teachers, um, there seemed to be, an, and there was an intersection of this more traditional culture that was filtered through to the students. Ah, and of course, at the time too, Catholic schools were more or less boarding schools. So the Catholic curriculum, very much European slash uh, Samoan in a very small percentage of it. The curriculum there conditioned these young women to a more Christian aspect of uh, living in the future. Check out how many of them is wearing shoes. And of course, to this end, Holy Communion Sundays, always those sort of things. Uh, and it seems like you would engage with whatever is available through the church. And of course, here, uh, boarding schools also. These uh, young uh, uh, girls are more or less half-caste uh, uh, Samoans, the part European Samoans. And the curriculum, of course, in... Um, Well, uh, included things like Latin uh, and uh, all the things that you would find in a, in a European school. 
uh, European Catholic school, that is. But during feast days or feast days like saints' feast days and uh, the and the birthday for bishops, they would have these uh, occasions where a lot of people would come together and dance and uh, in terms of cel celebration as well. Uh, Some on women's engagement with popular culture also reflected social and racial divisions. A colonial social capital gained by the accident of birth and family uh, wealth enabled some half-caste women to have a more extensive experience with foreign popular culture compared to women in the villages. Uh, and Samoans with Western connections sometimes had their daughters educated in Germany, the United States. A lot uh, of the American Samoan uh, young women engaged with American uh, pop culture at the time. Well, this was before the, in the 1920s. Or if you uh, have connections uh, or as lived have traveled to and from New Zealand, exposing them to a much wider range of pre-war pop culture. And the young women returned to Samoa and brought with them some of the culture they had experienced overseas. And it is important to note that there were half castes also who chose to live as Samoans, as some of my participants as well, who despite um, the very foreign and European looking um, claims that her family's lifestyle was grounded in the Samoan way. But in terms of motion pictures, we did have the motion pictures started in the 19, uh, I think 1914, uh, around about the 19, 1910s. But there was also the colonial government, the colonial administration who was adamant in censorship uh, regulations. So what you see has already been filtered. And late, uh, there is, I forgot to put on that, uh, what you filter, what they decided to do is they don't want to give you a lot of um, motion pictures that would create um, the feeling of rising against the colonial uh, uh, administration. So E.H. Uh, e. Uh, Paul, who uh, started the one of the first uh, part Samoan, um, part Samoan uh, uh, entrepreneur at the time, found it very difficult to have some of the things that they wanted to see be brought across because it was stopped by the um, administration. But then you have talkies. Talkies are those motion pictures, the ones that are, that you can actually, you know, similar to the generation of what we have, is you can actually hear. Talkies came around 1935. Uh, and here is the uh, first company that, Samoan company that put up these uh, theaters uh, at Samoan Theater Limited. So these are the things that are, uh, um, just uh, in a nutshell, and you have these from the Archives New Zealand where they, some of the brochures here, um, let me read this. Uh, special session for children will commence at 7 p.m. The, the brochure for uh, the program for, for talkies on dates to be announced from time to time. The highly popular Mickey the Mouse pictures will very likely hold pride of place to the hearts of the youngsters, but there'll be all other amusing pictures. Uh, the slogan continues, good pictures for good children. These are some of the material that was handed and given out at the uh, at the theater or even or around the pier during that time to to inform the public like the flyers uh, about what was going to uh, be on at the time and Skinner's baby was one of those new ones uh, that were going they were going to show but then came World War II 
and it brought a different kind of uh, material as well. Wartime uh, materials were tools designed to sustain. Uh, it was really something that was designed for the uh, the soldier. But of course, the, sol the soldiers came to Samoa and the, the theater of war was not a vacuum. There were people who were living there and what they saw, they, what was the movies they were showing specifically for the Marines, it was not difficult to invite the villagers as they were the everyday audience to all the military activities. The motion pictures in the villages grew odd combination of Samoas into the tents. The GIs, Samoan win, uh, women and children congregated to see American representation of fantasy and the reality being gl glamorously onto the screen. And some of the women saw the Raka Cowboy, the cowboy movies, as uh, Damien Salesa also uh, referred to in his other papers. But of course, what accompanies them is the idea, the candy, the sweet, the cookies, and the homemade uh, donuts, because there was a high availability of uh, sugar and flour. They brought it in boats, loads of them. But it created Popular culture, it created um, a, a, a different kind of, uh, of vision as well. If you're comparing Dorothy Lamour to a young uh, woman from, um, compare these two, uh, uh, the poster and what were and a photo that was uh, taken by one of the uh, American Marines when they were here, it seems that uh, there really is the, uh, the Polynesian women, uh, the notion of the Polynesian women during the, the war contrasted with the Hollywood infused and glamorized portrayal of Polynesian women, which shaped the American GI's view of Samoan women. Of course, the Polynesian uh, celluloid women, glad and sarongs, were military sanctioned doses of erotic fantasy. A lot of Samoan women adopted were given the name um, Dorothy Lamour, as some of the other um, uh, characters, some of the other young women uh, were called. But here is a scene when you have a young person who first went to see the movies. It was an eye opener, not so much of what was going on, but how he came to experience that uh, the movie is not really uh, a life, uh, uh, a real life occasion. It was a movie. And uh, there are many different um, experiences. But what they said is that they did enjoy what they saw. And of course, everyone clapped when the South Seas came because there were these beautiful Hollywood actors uh, who were acting out the Polynesian, the Hollywood version of Polynesian women. Uh, I'm mindful of my time, uh, but you know, the frame popular culture, it did provide a unique opportunity to reflect on the lives of uh, women and uh, to reflect uh, as a society as well, enjoying these uh, material culture as they come in through different people. Uh, uh, it's also um, looking at how we engage with wartime events and there were many, many different events. This here justifies that there were different uh, engagements and there was uh, um, 
a lot of other things we did other than to paint that one um, take picture that it's women and the small babies. Uh, that's just uh, enough to whet the appetite, but if you, I am continuing to uh, work on the uh, article and hopefully it'll be finished uh, soon. <laughs>